Hello, Internet! Hi! And welcome Hello. to Voices from the Vortex. We're here. My name is Taylor. I'm, uh, I'm Matthew. And we're going to talk about Doctor Who today. Again. Yes. Um, so everybody knows this is our second take. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of screwed up on the first one there. It didn't, didn't record right. That's okay. We got... <laughs> We got a good five minutes of discussion. Now we know how it's going to go. Yeah, yeah we'll run down. through. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's for the benefit of the listener. Well, you guys will be. Able to... <laughs> yeah. It's a benefit That's someone. Over there. Yeah. So, um, basically, we're doing a Doctor Who podcast here. I know we're the first ones. We're a little late to the game. <laughs> very, very, uh, very late. Six yes, years then. Been, yeah, there's been, you know, at least six seasons of this show mm-hmm. and uh but uh we're gonna get to it mm-hmm. but for now what we're going to do is we're going to do um a podcast for each season of the show up until the fall when we'll have the new episodes and then we'll be doing a podcast for each episode so so people know we are we are obsessed with doctor who um, very much so. We are huge uber dorks about it. Mm-hmm. Um, probably me more than most, but yes, we are both huge nerds. Um, Taylor, very much so, is the from the audience's point of view. He loves watching it and experiencing it. And I'm a little more of the technical guy. I look at a lot of the back of the, you know, what's going on in the background and what's going on with the producers and why this thing meant this. And so, you know, I'm that guy. That guy. Mm-hmm. You never invite to parties. <laughs> so we're gonna uh, we're gonna tell you a little about a little bit about ourselves and how we got into Doctor Who and and uh, and just sort of our experience with it and uh, I'll let Matt go first because he introduced it to me <laughs> so I'll let you go first and tell how you uh, got into it. Well, um, I'm 29 and when I was about I was seven, eight, nine years old, uh, I started getting into it. Uh, the old show, actually, which first began. 1963 and ended in 1986. Uh, when I was younger, used to be on PBS. My dad used to record it. Uh, it was every Sunday night. You had one Doctor Who story, which in those days were like four to eight episodes, actually, uh, little 30-minute episodes all compiled together for one big story. And my dad used to record it, and then on Mondays we'd watch it. And that was um, that's where the love began. Just over over time, as I kept getting older and kept watching these episodes, and uh, really just fell in love with it. Uh, and of course, there was that twenty years where there wasn't Doctor Who, and I was very, very, very sad. <laughs> and then, and then they brought it back. It was two thousand five as a new show. Now, uh, how did you react? Because I would, my head would have blown up. Uh, yeah, it did actually. I had a couple of geekasms. Um, yeah. No, I, it was it was amazing. You, you have to remember the old show was just it's very campy, it's very early British sci-fi, so there you know wasn't a lot of a budget. So when I saw the first episode of the new show, it was just phenomenal. I mean, you, you had never seen something that good before, and uh, you know everything was there. The Doctor had everything that was the Doctor. You know, this his ship, the TARDIS, was there, and though it's different on the inside, it was there. You know, it was the TARDIS, and it it was the same thing. Um, he had a sonic screwdriver, same thing. He had you know all these pieces of what made him the Doctor were still still a part of it it was just so much more to it and mm-hmm. that, that did that really did that um that was more than i needed i <laughs> my, my, my love affair began again i couldn't help yes it. an old flame came back it bought me dinner and before i knew yes, it, i was lying in bed with my dvd player hello <laughs> old friend well i'm 26 and uh matt introduced me to doctor who and uh, basically uh it was I think it was a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. So the uh, it had just started like the sixth season or the or, or I, I'm not quite yeah. sure. Yeah, and uh, so he introduced me to it. He showed me the first episode, and I thought, okay, uh, this looks pretty interesting. Uh, one thing I will say is that it does look a little old-fashioned as far as like like I don't know what it was. It was 2005, and it was like I've seen TV in America in 2005. Yeah. The quality seemed a little like lower, and I thought, well, okay, this seems a little campy and silly, but but I gave it a shot, and and I kept watching, and it's like, it it completely 
like went way past what I thought it would be. Uh, and uh, and I love it. I I never really considered myself a nerd until um, just like a few years ago. I got into a few things here and there. I always liked you know things like Star Wars and stuff like that. But uh, uh, my wife introduced me to Lost, which was which, was, which is my big. <laughs> My big fandom. That's the thing. If if Lost came back twenty years from now with like something, <laughs> you'd hear there'd be a news story. Man goes crazy in the streets. Um, but uh, but Doctor Who is definitely on my number two. It's it, it's a uh, it's it's a really great thing, and and it's becoming more and more popular in America now. Um, there was a, just a thing on Entertainment Weekly um, saying that. Doctor Who is just becoming so big in America, and you know there's all these references to it on TV and in other shows, and uh, and uh, there was I think there was a quote by Stephen Moffat in the article saying something like you know it's not just some British show, it's not even a British import, it's just it's Doctor Who, it's this this big thing, it's just kind of a, even global, you know, but um, yeah, so that's where I really got into it, and. Uh, and you know, I'm just so excited to do this podcast. We're we're gonna have a great time. And uh, Matt and I, we love to talk about Doctor Who, and it'll be great now because we we'll get to. I just finally we're just finally caught up now. So, like when the new episode <laughs> come out, we'll be able to talk right after for the first time. Yeah, first time. Yeah, it, it was. Yeah, we'll do these Skype so, podcasts uh, right away. Yeah, episode will end, and we'll get on, and we're like, oh my god, did you oh, see you? it? Like, oh, yeah. I saw. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do this episode is we're going to talk about Season 1. Um, so if you haven't seen Season 1 yet, go watch it right now. You can pause it, mm-hmm. and we'll, we'll, we'll take a break. Yep. So you, even so you can watch it. We'll give you, here, we'll give you a moment of silence. Ready? Okay, ready. Okay. <laughs> we're back. What, wasn't it great? Didn't you like it? Okay. We're going to talk about it now. And uh, for those of you who, uh, you know, are just like – watching it with us i know i got a i got somebody who told me that hey they're gonna i'm gonna give your podcast a listen i just started watching it i've only seen season one so don't worry we're not gonna talk too much about really uh, at all about the future seasons right until we get to those so and um but if you have season one make sure you watch it and then because we're gonna spoiler alert we're gonna talk about season one (laughs) so um yeah the, the podcast going forward we're gonna have one for each season and then we'll, we're going to discuss. I mean, we'll discuss a lot of technical stuff too. The the idea of you know how the budget got, kept getting bigger, how the each season refers back to the older seasons. And right. Then, um, so we'll go through episode by episode for each season per podcast. And then whenever we finally get to the seventh season, we'll have episode by episode. Uh, and feel free at any time, you know, to to listen to these podcasts. If you've got questions, we certainly, you know, uh, Voices of the Vortex Tumblr dot com, uh, uh, Vortex Podcast is our Twitter, our Twitter, uh, the Facebook page, Voices from the Vortex. It's right. you know, send us some, send us some feedback. Yes, yeah, we're on the web, <laughs> yeah. the World Wide Web. Voices from the oh, Vortex guess. at gmail dot com. Send us some emails, mm-hmm. and we yeah. will, uh, we'll read those and answer them. So, sure will. Um, so we're going to go ahead and start off here uh, with season one. Now, the first episode is Rose. We meet Rose Tyler. She works at a shop, and all of a sudden, plastic mannequins start coming alive. Mm-hmm. And I, and when I first saw this, I thought, well, this is pretty campy. It's pretty goofy. <laughs> and then, even later, when the trash can comes alive, I was like, oh, brother. <laughs> but it's kind of a scare. It was almost, like, creepy, too, you know. Mm-hmm. Creepy and, you know, and campy at the same time. I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. I like this. So, um... The, the first words that the doctor says, he grabs her hand and he says, run. And I thought, oh, that's just perfect. It's very a, Doctor Who. Yeah, what a perfect line for doc, for this new Doctor Who show and for the first, you know, for his first line. Um, and this, for, for those of you who don't know, um, you know, he's, he's, right, he's an alien. Mm-hmm. You know, he travels through time and space. And this is the ninth form of him right right so they don't really specify that in the first episode you know you don't really know that this is the ninth version of some guy but you know they get to that later well they found they found a really good place to start it you know the first season is so 
it's so primer. You can you can step into it at any time and kind of learn everything you need. And mm-hmm. right off the bat, you know, you've got the Doctor right after some huge war, uh, the Time War, where his people and the villains really of Doctor Who, uh, the Daleks, sort of uh, masochistic flying Nazis and tin cans in space. Um, there, <laughs> you know, it, you have these two forces that were fighting each other for the sake of all creation. And according to the Doctor. Everybody lost. Um, you know, his yeah. people are gone. The Daleks are gone. He's the last of his kind. So he flew away in a little, little. He flew away in a blue box. And... He flew away in a blue box. He did. The theme for the first season is survivor's guilt. He's so filled with pain and with with this this twistedness inside. He's so upset and bitter over all the stuff he had to do during the time war and the things he saw. Uh, you know, and, and for this first season to get over that as he's running through time, just just fighting monsters, moving on. Fighting monsters, moving on. Uh, It's Rose, this girl he meets, who he thinks, you know, maybe not consciously, but he suddenly realizes, I guess, uh, somehow, this girl's going to make me better. And that's what she does. Um, From the the first episode until the sixth, Dalek, it's her making him better. And then from the seventh episode to the end, uh, episode 13 of the season, it's, you know, how they still coexist now that he's getting over the things that have that have tortured him mm-hmm. um, yeah one thing I noticed I, I actually for in preparation for this I watched uh, I, I watched a few episodes of this season and then I sort of researched the other ones I watched the first one this was the one I watched and uh, one thing I noticed at, at one point he looks in the mirror mm-hmm. and he goes oh not bad oh the years you know yeah. And I'm it's thinking, sort of, it's sort of the supposing first... that's the first time he's seen himself. Since yeah, that's the, that's the thing I was asking. Is is this the first time he's really seen himself? And it... because then later, and I thought maybe this was maybe just an error or something. Right. Because then later she goes to to see the conspiracy guy, mm-hmm. and he's got all these pictures of the doctor. So he's been having so prior to this, between the war and this, he's been having a few adventures on his own. Yeah, yeah very much story. so. This is not his first adventure since the war. Yeah. But you, you, you kind of get this this idea that you know right after you know that the you know and obviously they don't say in the first season we'll get to it later but when the war ends there's this traumatic event enough that actually he regenerates he even says he didn't want to survive you know he didn't survive by choice it happened and he regenerated and he didn't mean to I guess and um, you know so from right just from the get go he is he is running and doing stuff and yeah he has his picture taken he has his picture drawn he's in this picture and that picture all through history but he's not stopping to look at it he just keeps going and finally he takes this moment to look in the mirror and he goes oh, yeah. it could have been worse you know could have been worse just, yeah all right whatever you know that's what i look like now um, yeah one thing yeah one thing i'm really interested in as going back and watching this i'm really interested in the change from the 8th doctor to the ninth doctor and sort of how that happened. Now you said he he regenerated at the end of the war. I didn't. When did he say that? I didn't hear. Well, he he does he doesn't say it exactly. Um, but you get you know like we said, there's that one movie that happened that was the only actual yeah. uh, broadcast of the Eighth Doctor. Yeah, and I researched the end of the movie, and I guess he just he flies off in a spaceship. Right, and then the war and happened, it, oh. and then just sometime by the end of the war, he's regenerated, and right. he's just you know. He's just off and going. Um, it, it's it's one of those things in the show's history that the Doctor never had control over his regenerations. And quite a few in the old show, quite a few of his regenerations, he wasn't entirely sure he was going to survive. But there are other Time Lords he's met in the old show who have no problem with regeneration. In fact, they can even predict or change into whatever they want to be. So it's it's very much so the Doctor's not skilled in this, whatever it might be. Um, just from the previous stuff so for him to just you know yeah I get it he he, he, he thought he was going to die he didn't he didn't have time to stop and say what happened to me he was trying to get through it and trying to keep mm-hmm. moving uh, the guy who brought the show back is Russell T. Davies and Russell T. Davies uh, is notorious in England he was the guy who wrote the original L Word in England um, he is a, a very very prolific uh, prolific writer he uh, his idea was a very modern Doctor Who. You know, if Doctor Who landed today, how would we react to it? So that first episode is very grounded. It's very this is our world. You know, and right? It's like, on Earth. The episode he takes place on Earth. Yeah, it's not. It's not on a far flung planet that and looks like a rock quarry. Right, and he then his his companion is 
an Earth girl. You know, I know, I know. In some of the old show, he had some people that from some other planets. Mm-hmm. He does. You know. He's had he's had many. He's had aliens. He's had humans. He's right. uh, he had a, an android, a, a shape changing android for a while, and mm-hmm. a robot dog. Mm-hmm. And and other time lords. He has had other time lords with him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. So it's it's a very grounded episode. And Russell uh, Davies was talking about how you know you said uh, you mentioned the the trash can. And what he really wanted was something that was frightening on a very basic level. So he wanted kids – this is a kid's show. You know, This is classified as children's programming in England. He wanted kids to watch this and to be so scared of taking out the trash the next morning that they would hide behind the couch, you know, staring, staring over, looking at the monsters. Um, and that's uh, – I think he does that very well. I think even with the, the kind of cheesy effects, it, the, the scariness comes off. Yeah. Um, one other thing I noticed was like we, we see the inside of the TARDIS. Now I would assume this is a new look Very for the TARDIS. Dark. Okay, what did it look like before? Because I I've, I've never seen it. Obviously, uh, if any, if like, you've never seen in, it, in the movie, I guess what it, did they show it in the well, movie? Like, well, see now the movie I think has one of the best looking Tardises ever. Uh, it's gorgeous. <laughs> it's very Victorian era steampunk. It's got you know, um, it's 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 got the the Tardis console, which looks like a like a steampunk metal you know thing with uh, with dials and knobs and, and very very um, if you, if you know what I'm saying when I say steampunk, very steampunk. Uh, mm-hmm. But then, at the same time, like the wall, or is a is a wall of books, and it's a bookcase, and there's a carpet on the floor, and he sits. Oh, up, see, yeah, he sits none of that. Victorian we got chair, little, and yeah, there's little circle windows, these beams that come in. It's, it's gorgeous. It's it's this beautiful. The one thing I think is always so funny is there's a railing, and then there's padding on the rail. Like, <laughs> it's like part of, it looks like part of the set that they got in in the shot. Right. I'm like. I, I guess he's worried about safety. <laughs> crash, crash, uh, crash padding. That's what it is. Yes, exactly. You've seen it fly around. I mean, it's like I people go running into it headlong into it. Um, well, um, it was funny. He he's with Rose, and she's he saves her from the people. And then he's uh, she follows him, and he's pushing her away. And I thought that was very interesting that he pushes her away. Well, that's all about that pain, right? I mean, he's he's yeah. trying to keep anyone from getting close to him because all he has now is the pain. And when you're like that, you don't want to you don't want to give in to that. Um, mm-hmm. So you meet a bunch of people in the first episode. It's you know very. Let's start here. You meet Rose Tyler, who travels with him. You meet yeah, her, her mom, Jackie, her boyfriend Mickey, a uh, boyfriend uh, Mickey. Uh, so a bunch of stuff is really put the kind of put out there, and the villains of the episode are the Autons, who are uh, the Nesting Consciousness, which is an old villain from the old show, right away brought back into the new show, sort of thrown at you, saying, "Hey, we are the same Doctor Who." Mm-hmm. You know, you even mm-hmm. get a, a reference to the Time War. Um, one of the big references when the Doctor is approaching and talking to the Nesting Consciousness. The Nesting Consciousness, rah rah rah, and the Doctor, I couldn't save your world. I couldn't right. save. I had to it out. Yeah, I couldn't save your world. I thought that was like, uh, I was so like, oh, that's a mythology thing. There, that's you know. Yeah, there's certain things for the episode. Then they say a line, and you're like, oh, that has to do with the whole story. It's a very dry. It's a very throwaway line. You don't know what you're hearing. Um, so, and we'll come back to a lot of this stuff too as we go on. There is a line there when he first walks in where he says, Articles of the Shadow Proclamation, uh, which is very much so a drop in line. I, I can't imagine they were going to play off of that ever. So, that might be something later on that we'll, we'll discuss. But, uh, mm-hmm. was, and, and yeah. before we move on to the next, ep- the next episode, I gotta say, Eccleston was fun. Like, he was great, I thought. You yeah. know, it was, it was a great doctor. Maybe he was only around for the first season. Uh, you know, sure. I think. I think he would have been great, at least for two or something, you know, to see where, what else he could have done. I think he would was a great. Nice to see that, yeah. I mean, yeah. and it's so. unfortunate that we never will. It's unfortunate uh, his parting was was a was a big argument really between him and and I guess the producers. Uh, he didn't want to do. He didn't want to go where they were taking the character. So he says, um, uh, as that he said in an in, in interview. So I mean, it, who knows? But. It's sad. I would ever, that he was you know, I I would jump for joy if I ever heard that they they were going to do something where he was going to come back and like you know, yeah, which they've done before where timelines cross and all that. But that would well, I mean, that would it's possible. That would be amazing. I think one of the things we'll talk about I, I, when we get to the newer the newer podcasts 
are that we have uh, we have the 50th anniversary coming up next year. So, saying this now, right here at the beginning of a podcast, 50th anniversary is next year, and it's possible there will be a multi doctor episode. That's which uh, I, I, if nine, nine, ten, and eleven are all together, that <laughs> that would I, that would just be great for me. I, I was I think that would be amazing. Throw an eight, come on, let's do it. Let's do the time. Oh yeah, so let's bring okay, eleven yeah. to the time war. Bring ten in. Uh, wait, seven? Is he still alive? Six, seven, uh, you know. six, five, and four are all alive. However, hey, throw them all in them, there. Only the one of them looks the part anymore. So uh, that's true. Yeah, they heroes. did gold. But, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Eddie. well, uh, we're going to move on to the... Do you have anything else on Rose? No, well, we can move on. We'll move on to the next one. It's the end of the world. They go to uh, the satellite, or the, the space station, and they're going to watch the end of the world. And it's a all... space episode, right off right. the bat. Yeah. Um, yeah they, go from, they go from Earth, and then they go to the end of, the, like, 5,000, which I thought was like, whoa, they're leaders. really going for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, end of the world. You see all these goofy characters... <laughs> That come in. <laughs> so there's one woman who's like half tree. Was there? Was there were those the munch? The blue munchkins? Yeah, that's the blue thing. There's uh, there's the the last human ever who's this like Andra. This like stretch of skin, a face, and a brain in the jar underneath. <laughs> Just hilarious. Um, this is the first time we see psychic paper. Yep. He uses psychic paper to get in. It's this paper where you show him, and it's like it shows the person whatever they want us, whatever they, you want them to see. Um, and uh, they mentioned the time war some more, and I'm really interested in the time war. So I'm hoping, you, you know, you've you've got this theory here that it's the 50th, whatever, and they're gonna they may talk about the time war. They might into it, and that would be just that would be great. So um, yeah, that was kind of all I had. It was, I mean, it was um, fun, but I liked it. A couple things to note. I, I really love that uh, Billy Piper plays Rose Tyler. Billy Piper is famous not just in, as an actress now, but she's famous as being a, a pop star in England, um, much like our Madonna or our Britney Spears. And why that's interesting is because they played a Britney Spears song uh, during the episode as, as oh, part yeah. of the background music. Uh-huh. Just, I really love that, that that's another way they were making it modern was we're not just going to have this kind of cheesy, you know, electronic, phonic sound in the background and, you know, we'll have the themes. We're going to play some classical everything. music. Yeah, we're going to, yeah, classical <laughs> music. It's true. On an iPod. Yes. Um, so, no, I like that. And uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, the doctor's life is not, it's it's not safe. And this episode proves it. She uh, yeah. she is put in truly mortal danger because she followed the doctor, and and no fault of her own. Um, mm-hmm. And that and that well yeah and, and, that's, the, tree, and the, the tree lady dies. She dies very much. Yeah, another uh, yeah, could so, would be companion uh, yeah. dies to save to save the doctor and to save everyone's life, and, it, and yeah. she does it in the name well, of the doctor. Right. And there's usually like in the episode, there's usually uh, he's got his companion, but then there's also the what what I heard I heard once and I like it I like to call it it's, they're the local authorities, uh, the local authority on what's going on. Right. You know that the person there's always a person who he talks to and they help him out a little bit. Hold on. You know they're not the companion but they're like you know. It's a it's a formula of Doctor Who. You've got the Doctor yeah. who is supposed to be alien. You you don't you don't trust him yet and you shouldn't trust him yet. You know you don't know this man. First time you meet him stuff gets crazy and and. You know, people get hurt and could could die. You know, um, and then the second time he puts his companion's life in danger. So you, this is this is man who's a stranger. There's us as a character who's the companion that goes with him. We're Rose at this point in time. And then yeah, there's always someone in the time period he lands who ends up either befriending the doctor or helping the doctor. And that right. that is a consistent formula mm-hmm. that works with these stories, and it, right. it makes the doctor a legend. Because he doesn't have to be good or bad. He can make decisions that are wholly questionable. We can be the companion that's trying to make sure that everything turns out okay. And then there's someone else who supports it. And that, that I feel like, that, 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 that trifecta there really makes Doctor Who what it is. That right. he is something more because of that. Okay. All right. So are we ready to move on? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the next episode is The Unquiet Dead. And... Um, uh, the one thing I, I noted about this episode was is this the first instance we see uh, um, somebody famous like from yep. history it's a that he interesting. interacts with first so he interacts with uh, Charles Dickens uh-huh. and uh, and uh, um, which uh, there's a lot you know and they always do like some little funny 
what in Shakespeare? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the, the other thing, I, when I watched this episode for the first time, in the end, um, Gwendolyn, I think her name is. Gwen, yeah. Gwendolyn. Yeah. Gwyneth. Gwyneth, that's it. She's, she's helping, uh, she's helping the doctor, and she dies at the end of this. Yeah. And I thought, okay, is somebody gonna, who helps the doctor, they're gonna die in the end of every episode. <laughs> <laughs> Help him out. I was like, this is going on. So, uh, um, I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, this was kind of cool. They what they did was they they started in the present and then they go way into the future. Right. And then this so they're like this is in the this is Doctor Who in the past. And I was like, okay, I see. That this is going to be a sort of a hodgepodge. Every episode is going to be like something different. Yeah. Something well, different. Some different it's, theme or. Whatever. It's setting up the it's setting up the process because this is that what you see here, modern day for the first episode future in the second, past in the third, and then what we're going to get to is we're going back to the present. That's going to be the same process season by season. That's mm-hmm. what we're going to follow that, uh, that that thread, and, and it's it's going to become a little predictable, but then you know what episodes to wait for. If you love the space future stuff, you'll know where they're going to come in a season. Yeah. So, um, Do you have I anything love- on this one? Oh yeah, I love I love it. Uh, this one is written by Mark Gatiss. This is the first episode by Mark Gatiss. Um, he's a name that we're going to talk about a lot more as the seasons go on. Uh, Russell T Davies did the first two episodes. He also does the two after this. Uh, but Mark Gatiss is very very popular writer now. He he does write for Sherlock now with Stephen Moffat um, as well as as he's acted both in Doctor Who and in Sherlock. And he has – this really – I mean this proves that he's got the chops to write almost anything. This feels very PBS, very masterpiece theater. And uh, – oh, uh, this also introduces the Rift in Cardiff. This right. is where the Rift is actually yes, first yes. formed where it will start bleeding that energy that we'll get to later. Yeah. Um, OK, so we'll move on to Aliens of London is the next one. Um, now, back to what I was saying earlier, then there's – they get to this part where there's this uh, there's this um, scientist, she's an Asian woman and I, I thought, okay is this going to be the person who helps and then she dies in the end, <laughs> you know uh, but now then she just happened to be a throwaway character, but um, the one thing I will say about this episode where it kind of got silly in this one, was all the farting yeah you know, I was like, why the farting? It's, 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 it's children's programming, so yeah, to a, to an extent, like, you're, you're seen, you're seen Merlin. Yeah, no, not yet. No, there's an episode of Merlin where uh, the king, like, is he got a spell on him, and he's, he falls in love with this troll, this woman. Like, she's a troll, and and uh, she's like in disguise or whatever. But then, like, whenever she's the troll, she's like always oh, hunched over. She's like, yeah, and then she's like. Farting all the time, and I just and my wife and I were like, "Oh my god, why all the farting?" <laughs> it, is, it is it is some of the these two episodes are great and terrible at the same time, and that's yeah, yeah exactly. Is so for kids, it's so you know Disney HD, and yeah. then but then you get you know I, I love the whole they she was gone for a year, you know they land and, and she's just been that's gone for like, a year. She's a 19 year old girl and she was gone for a whole year. Of course, she's all the freaks out. And Mickey was like, and... her boyfriend has been interrogated. And <laughs> oh. All this stuff. I was like, oh, that stinks. Why didn't they? They messed it up. All right. So, okay, well, uh, 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 important things to know both Aliens of London and the second part, World War III. Um, first off, the introduction of Harriet Jones, uh, MP for Fly Del North. We'll see her again. Uh, she really does become a great recurring character. Uh, she, uh, the the wonderful Penelope Wilton. She's she's incredible at acting, just absolutely top notch. And uh, she's great in Shaun of the. I liked her in Shaun of the Dead. Oh, she's, she's I yeah. Everything she does, she just she brings this British sense to it. It just it just yeah, yeah. Out perfect. Um, the other yes. thing though I wanted to mention was this is uh you you said it before the Asian woman who's the scientist. Yes. You're starting to see it now. Doctor Who is famous for taking people that have worked with people on Doctor Who before, bringing yes. them in and then keeping them around. Yes. And we, we're not there yet, but that, that Asian lady, as well as Gwyneth from the previous episode, uh, both come back. 
uh, act, the actresses come back to play characters and they do address, you know, um, who they are and how they. Yeah, and actually, what I the the Asian woman, uh, I actually looked it up, and uh, apparently that that is the same character. Same character, yeah, yeah, which I thought was really cool that they did that. And we'll talk about that when we get at least when we get to season two, we can talk about it. Um, uh, a couple I, things that I just thought were yeah. funny about this episode. Uh, Mickey the idiot, but all of, a sudden he's, all of a sudden he's a computer genius. Yep. <laughs> you know, he's like, I'm hacking into the mainframe. You know, I'm like, well, I thought you were an idiot. What happened? <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, I guess he's really smart now. Um, don't look and the my other thing is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, don't read my emails. <laughs> that was good. And the other thing is, uh, when a missile is coming your way, get in the door frame. You'll be all right. <laughs> Yeah, you'll be fine. As line with lead. Ask <laughs> yeah. fallout shelter. You're fine. Fine. Just get in the door frame. It'll be all right. Uh, do you have anything? Do you have anything else on this? <laughs> the Slovene are an absolutely ridiculous villain, and I'm glad yeah. we see them very few, uh, very few times. Especially, yeah, especially after they, you know, they came out of their human skins. They're still goofy. They, you know, <laughs> zippers on the zip. Wait, literally zippers on the monsters. Yeah, yeah. there you are. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, um, the next episode is Dalek, and I'm the one who watched this one. I wanted to talk about this one. This is the best episode of the first season, in my opinion. I loved it. I thought it was great, yeah. The most amount of emotion you're ever going to get out of the Doctor, I think, comes in this episode. Um, we talked about he, he fought in a time war with his people versus the Daleks. Everyone died but him, and then suddenly one Dalek survived. Uh, mm-hmm. One Dalek having crashed from the time war. Um, screamed, screamed for months, and then someone managed to get a hold of it and bring it to this uh, Henry Van Staten, his bunker deep in Salt Lake City, Utah. And, well, in this year, actually, in 2012. Um, what's interesting about this episode, a couple things. One, the Daleks have been to Earth before in the old show, but nobody remembers them. It's very important that a lot of the old show stuff doesn't seem to exist anymore, and that's because when the Time War happened... You know, all that stuff was pulled from time. It was all taken out of time, you know, wherever it was before it happened. So that they could fight that greater battle. Mm -hmm. So, really, Henry Van Staten should know what the hell a Dalek is. And he should know how dangerous it is, but he doesn't. Mm -hmm. And that's that's beautiful. Um, Mm -hmm. I love love that he, you know, it's it's the perfect setup for just everything falling apart. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I really love about this episode... um, is the Doctor and the Dalek, because at this point in time, they've both become the same thing. You know, the Daleks are the scourge of the universe, scourge of time and space, and this last Dalek is doing what it does. It knows to exterminate. It's looking for orders. And the Doctor is the last of his species. Doing exterminate! <laughs> yeah, exterminate! Can I just say, can I just say real quick, <laughs> the first time I saw this, I was like, you were telling me about it, you're like, the Daleks, they're like the big bad guy in the yeah. show. I laughed so hard when this thing showed up. I was like, it's got a plunger! It's got a little laser! You know, a little lights on the top of his head, look like ears. Yeah. I was like, this thing... I laughed so hard, but then it started shooting people. <laughs> Turn the skeletons, they go, ah! Yeah. And I, I was like, oh, crap, okay, okay. I, I can see why this thing's scary a little bit. Wait. One Dalek but to take over. Still, I love the Daleks now. I mean, they're just great. Um, and the one part that I, I loved the most was he gets to the stairs, and I was like, I laughed so hard. I was like, ah, oh, his only weakness, stairs. Yeah. <laughs> And then he goes, elevate, and he goes up, and I went, oh, no, he can elevate. <laughs> I was like, oh, they're all going to die. Well, but this was a long uh, argued point about Doctor Who is how the hell did the Daleks get upstairs? You yeah. never see them do something like this. And, of course, they would have some sort of anti-gravity booster, whatever oh. you want to call it. And uh, yeah. it's elevate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I really love the moments between the Doctor and the Dalek. There are those uh, three of them. The first one, when he first gets into the vault and he realizes it's a Dalek, and basically the Doctor gloating. Uh, the Doctor being the Dalek version of what the Daleks would fear. Um, yeah. You know, and you really see these two are the same. They're, they're both filled with rage, and the Doctor's so filled with it now, he doesn't even see it. Uh, you know, previous episodes, he's, he's actively killed 
or let die the villains. That's mm-hmm. what the Doctor never would have done. The Doctor is always he had a the last human on Earth. He just like he let her die. The thing, and she just turned to dust. Yeah, he was oh. mean about it. Yeah. So it, you, you, he's filled with all this rage, and then and then the second the second conversation uh, over the monitor when the Dalek and the Doctor are talking, and the Doctor says, "You're never going to get any orders. You know, why don't you just kill yourself?" and and uh, the Dalek with you know, no, I've got to, I've got to go on. Um, and then, of course, the final, the final confrontation at the end, where the Dalek has finally realized that it is the last of its kind, and it has changed because of Rose. And the Doctor is about to become what the Dalek is. He's about to exterminate the Dalek species. And you really see that Rose affects everyone. Rose really brings out the good in people. Because the Dalek changes because of her, and the Doctor's mm-hmm. changed because of her. And at the end, you see you see the Doctor just sort of accepting that he's finally the you know, okay, he's the last, and this might be something he deals with going forward, but at least he's got Rose, and at least he didn't kill the Dalek. And that's a step forward. Right. Um, other thing to mention, too, the Cyberman head at the very beginning. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, he, he sees this old school Cybermen head, uh, the, the old version of the Cybermen, which are all long since dead now. Um, and uh, it's just really neat to see him see that, and you know, oh wow, you know, that's yeah, this is the same show as it was twenty, thirty years ago. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay, well, let's move on to the next one. Uh, this is the long game. Uh. So they. Uh, in the, in Dalek, they meet this guy Adam, right? Yeah. And he comes along with them for this one. And I was like, I, I was like, I don't like this guy. Yeah. You know, you know he you know he needs to get out of here. <laughs> and at the end of the episode, yeah, he he screws up big time, and they and that would suck to have to live <laughs> with the little pie thing on your head <laughs> and not have to do anything. One of, one of the things about the Doctor is that he picks up people. Um, he picks up strays, really. Uh, he Everywhere he goes, he looks for people that help him and would be good on the road. And then he kind of tricks them into coming with him. He's, Sorry, I just imagined like a bunch of stray dogs like all over the, <laughs> all over the TARDIS. They, they kind of are. I mean, he, you know... He's like, get off the... Get off the console. What are you doing? Get off of there. <laughs> in the in the past, he's he's tricked people into getting into the TARDIS, and you know, he 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 he. And now I'm taking off, and whoops! Guess I'll have to find our way back home, and you know, never yeah. does. Um, the most the most the most famous that I can remember is uh, uh the fifth uh, the fourth Doctor, Tom Baker, takes a, a woman named Tegan, a flight attendant. She wanders into the TARDIS looking for help because she thinks it's a police call box, and he sort of kidnaps her. And doesn't take her back, and uh, she, uh, you know, her whole time with him is him trying to get her back, and he can't control the TARDIS. So it's it's very Doctor Who that young Adam would just walk into the TARDIS with him, and he'd take off with without a care in the world about what's going to happen or where they're going. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, I, uh, Simon Pegg is in this episode. Simon, Simon Pegg. That's the thing. I, yeah, let's get some applause for Simon Pegg right now. The, the one thing I love about. Um, Doctor Who, and a lot of these British shows I've been watching lately, is I'm seeing a lot of people who I like recognize. And my wife and I were just talking about this. We were watching some second season, and there's a guy from Merlin on there. And uh, we, and uh, that's what she was like. Are there a lot of actors in Britain, or are they just like <laughs> recycling everyone? Uh, which I, I think it's part. great. I mean, there's a lot. I mean, every time, every time I see like the Harry Potter movies, there's a lot of people who you. I was like, oh, that guy was on Doctor Who. That guy was on Doctor Who. <laughs> well, and that's 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 the thing is, if you're on Doctor Who, you're connected for life. Um, we'll we'll yeah. get into this more once we get to seasons two, three, and four. But uh, after the season, it just gets ridiculous. Uh, David Tennant worked with Billy Piper on something on Casanova, and so he becomes the Doctor. And Matt Smith had worked with Billy Piper and with um, with David Tennant, so he became the Doctor. Uh, you know, but the character Martha was on the last episode of season two. It goes on and on and on like that. So it, it's yeah. they keep bringing in people. They're one big family. The same way, yeah. you know, and for us, uh, um, 
Seth Rogen works with Jason Siegel, who works with Neil Patrick Harris, and they're yeah, all kind yeah. of sharing movies and because they're friends. Yeah, like if you see the Adam, Adam Sandler movie, there's always yep. the same. Like he's got his buddies in there. The every Kevin movie. Smith yeah. movies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, we well, let's talk about the plot of this episode real quick. Uh, he goes because it comes up again mm-hmm. in the end of the season. Yep. They, he goes to Satellite Five. He's like, You're what's wrong? With the, yeah, what's wrong with the world? You yeah. know, this should be the fourth, whatever, bountiful, the fourth great and bountiful human empire. Human empire, right? So, uh, basically, everyone's getting their news from this station. Um, there's a weird thing on the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> the Jagrafess. Yes, that's it. I knew it had some weird. I can't remember. You, you're the one who remembers all these names. Bravo, <laughs> there, because I can't remember all these crazy documents. But anyway, 20, uh, 20 points for the person who can uh, write into us or uh, send us a video and actually say the full name. I don't think yeah, anyone I, other than uh, Simon Pegg has ever said it. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, the, um, Simon Pegg plays the editor. The editor. <laughs> right. Yeah. And he's, uh, uh, it's basically. Human um, mind is being controlled by the Jagrafess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Is, yeah. So the doctor sets this right, he turns the temperature down, and gets, or, yeah, he turns it down, and it's cold. Kills the Jagger Yeah, he just kills the Jagger so. And leaves, and he, he, assuming he sets, the world is back. Yeah, yeah he, is, he just assumes he sets everything right, and then when we get to the, the, the finale, we'll talk about that, it's not quite, um, not quite right. So I guess now we move on to Father's Day. Yes, and this was the one that I watched, and, uh, um... The one thing I want to talk about with this one is this is like the first episode um, in the new series, at least, where it really deals with um, time travel. Like mm-hmm. in the other ones, yeah, they traveled in time, but this one deals with like time travel within Rose's own right. timeline. The consequences of time travel. Dealing with consequences of changing the past, right? Um, so in this episode, she they go back. She wants to go see her father on the day he died and she ends up running through and saving him from getting hit by the car Mm -hmm. now this is an interesting this brings up a lot of interesting questions as far as um, the main one is um, is the doctor supposed to be doing these things helping these people um, you know, would these things be happening if he, you know what I mean? Like, it's mm-hmm. kind of, yeah. He, well, and he's, he very lives convenient. by the earth. I'm sorry. It's, yeah, it's, I'm just saying it's very convenient that he's, he's always there when there's a problem. <laughs> he just happens to be attracted to problems. Right, right exactly. Like, uh-huh. um, but he's changing the path. He's doing things to change things that, you know, they've, they've already happened before. They touch on this a lot more in the further seasons, um, so not, not, not to spoil anything, uh, but the Doctor has a very firm belief that there are certain things that should happen, certain things that must always happen, uh, and these are, these are very, very solid moments that his people can see them, and that those moments have to always happen, you know, um, certain things that define all of history. But mm-hmm. outside of that, you can do kind of anything in time and change things outside of those moments. And he kind of has a feel for it. So he knows when the right thing to do is and when the right thing isn't to do. So you really kind of see him, yeah, this episode really deals with what happens when someone breaks his own rules. What happens when someone steps in and says, no, I'm going to do something regardless. This is a very, very rare instance that the Doctor kind of forgives that. If you look at just just a, an episode before, uh, young Adam, you know, broke the doctor's rules. He he tried to make a profit mm-hmm. off of what was going on, and then and you know the doctor just leaves him behind. Rose alters history um, and causes the destruction of the universe, really. And, and right, yeah. And this this is where the 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 idea of time travel is very different here in this show than it is in some other things. Mm-hmm. Like for example, Back to the Future. It's like you can change things. But be careful because then the the timeline's going to be different when you get back right. or whatever. Um, and then other shows and like then, Lost. And then yeah, that's what my other point was. In Lost, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter if you go back in time. It doesn't matter because whatever you do, that's already happened. 
Right, it was meant to happen that way. It was meant to happen that way for you to be back there. So, um, so, but in this one, it's like, you can change things, but monsters appear. Yeah. <laughs> and eat people. <laughs> well, it's only yeah. like there were, there were paradoxes that were happening, and that, that's right. what they were doing. So, I, yeah. so, so, what they're saying is that Rose's father's death is one of these fixed points. Very possibly. That that might, it's so important that he has to die, which I kind of find a little hard to believe. But I guess I mean, well, it makes sense. If, if you look at the end of the season, though, you know Rose was always meant to become what she becomes at the end. She was meant to become the bad wolf. She takes in right. the, the time vortex. So if that's true, then it's absolutely important that Pete Tyler have died. You know, I see. I never thought of that. Like if if, if yeah, it, it's it, since Rose is so important. Right. It's important for her to be... Yeah, okay. I can see... So I had another question. My other question was... um, When Pete runs out in front of the car and sets everything back to normal, everything's fine, did he change everything completely, or was it... Or was it slightly different... um, because at the end they show the mom talking to Rose and saying, oh, there was a woman there. Um, so it, it sounds like he changed it, but did th- then does everyone remember the monsters or what happened there? There's a really there's a really good term that describes this that uh, p- puts itself out there later on on later seasons, but were they there? Yes. Do people remember them? Not really, but they do. It's sort of like... It's kind of in the back of everyone's mind, but the things that came out that started eating people, that never happened. So think of it like mm-hmm. this. Pete Tyler doesn't die when the one car tries to hit him at the one place, right? And then they go to the wedding. Once they arrive, that car comes turning around, and as far as anyone's concerned, Pete Tyler just hit the ground running and ran right into that car. And then, of course, you know... Uh, there you've got Jackie who sees there's this blonde girl who goes over and like holds his hand until the paramedics get there and then leaves. Right. And, you know... She doesn't remember earlier in the church, you know, when they were like, I'm your daughter. That actually happened, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. but you do gotta ask yourself, I mean, if you saw someone today and then 20 years from now saw them exactly the same, you know, would you know it was them? Um, and you wouldn't. You you throw it out of your mind. You push it to the back and never think about it again. You know, mm. you don't you don't think of those things. So that's that's really. I mean, people were confused, but they wouldn't have remembered her or the doctor. They wouldn't have remembered who these people were because they didn't really talk to them. They were just gone. Yeah. Kind of a there's a there's a lot of um, there's a lot of time travel convenience here. Well, yeah. I just remember him saying <laughs> things like. You know, if we change, if we do this right, no one's going to remember that that this happened or whatever. This, right. this. And I'm like, oh, that's convenient. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, the convenience of writing a Doctor Who script up and we undid everything. Don't worry, and they all forget. Yeah, <laughs> moving um, on. <laughs> so uh, I guess the next episode, the uh, second two parter in the season, mm-hmm. the Empty, Empty Child, Child and the Doctor Dances, uh, both written by Stephen Moffat, the current. Showrunner uh, and one of the most uh, sought-after writers for the show. He well, actually he wrote Doctor Who before it came back. There was a um, for the the children in need. They made a a, a big special um, before the show came back, and it starred it starred Rowan Atkinson as the Doctor, uh, mm-hmm. and was written by Stephen Moffat. It was sort of a a parody of Doctor Who. Um, but he was, he was so beloved, and it's such, so it was so uh, kitsch, you know, uh, that mm-hmm. when they started doing the new show, they said, "Well, we got to have him." Yeah, yeah. I, 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 you showed me that. It was really silly. <laughs> <laughs> it's meant I, to be, though. You know, it, it is, and I, and I love uh, Ron Atkinson, and Mr. Bean, and all that. So it was perfect. Um, okay, so well, in this one, um, they go to the Blitz. Mm-hmm happening, all that jazz. You know, the Germans are... There's an air raid going on. And, um... Jack there's, like, a Jack. child. Yeah, they meet Captain Jack, who, he's an ex-time... He's... This is... Um, we'll go into... Well, I think we can kind of go into it here. Um, 
at the end of the season, which we'll talk about in a minute, she brings him back to life. Right. So this is before this. And something special happens to him. So this is before this. He's just a normal guy. Yeah, he's a con artist from the future who doesn't... He's an, ex, his he's an ex-time ex- agent. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he's he's an interesting character. He's like... He's not gay. He's not really straight. He's not bi. He's like... He's just all about he's everybody. Sexual, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's So many planets, so little time. Yeah, ex- <laughs> exactly. He's just like... He's a horny guy for, like, everybody. Um, you saw a puppy which, dog in the that was a, kind of an interesting kind of a character. I never. I mean, there's not really. Well, I mean, you don't see that too often on anything else because there's, there's not a lot of shows with lots of different people from different planets. But um, well, and one of the things about Jack, we, we we talked about it before with Adam. You know, Adam was a companion that screwed up. Mm-hmm. And the doctor just leaves him there. And then you have Rose, who's with the doctor. She screws up, and the doctor keeps her with him because she she experiences the tragedy of her mistake. Jack is obviously a con man doing horrible things, and the doctor forgives him because Jack sees the error of his ways. Right. Okay. And, I mean, it's, it's, it's cool to see that, you know, characters that want to evolve... Uh, as characters, if they they decide they want to keep growing and they want to apologize for the things they've done, um, the doctor is very lenient about that. He he's he's sort of like the universal dad, you know. <laughs> well, you learned your lesson this time, kid. So come on, let's Not go get some dad. ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it does it does talk more about that that science fictiony stuff that these. The really, you know, the monsters aren't really monsters. There's no, there's no boogeyman that can't be explained. There's no mythical creature. It's always yeah. something scientific. And in this particular instance, it's uh-huh. nanobots. Yeah, I'll have to say, yeah, I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute when we get to the second part of this. Mm-hmm. But I'll have to say this is the first episode that really like creeped me out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, like the rest of them, I was like they're kind of campy and a little scary. But this one creeped me out for sure. Gas my zombie. The little kid, you know. Mm-hmm. Are you my mommy? I mean, that, you wouldn't think that's creepy, but it is a little creepy. It's a, you know what's creepy is the thing of something coming towards you and just like not stopping, mm-hmm. and just like walking towards you. And no matter what you say, they don't pay attention to you. They just keep walking towards. That's I mean that it's kind of a creepy thing. Um, one thing I thought was interesting is I thought the kid only said certain things. Mm-hmm. You know. But in the very beginning, he looks. He points up and he goes, "Balloon!" When yeah. Rose grabs the rope, I was like, "I didn't." I was like, "I thought he couldn't." You know, I, I didn't think he responded to like other things. I thought he just said. So I thought that was interesting that he said balloon. Well, you could <laughs> definitely that, and that should be a clue that right off the bat, this it isn't. It isn't really a monster. It's something that doesn't understand the world around it, which which is what a child is. Right. You know that that, but that that's just the clue because then they then they leave you in the complete yeah, lead you in the complete other yeah. direction. Yeah, and and this was the other one where um, this was the like first episode in the ser- in this um, season where there was no real bad guy. Right. It was just a mistake. Right. You know what I mean? Like, there's a few episodes like this later in the later series mm-hmm. where there's something. Um, I, I won't spoil anything, but um, you, you know what I'm talking about. There's pirate ship. Yeah. Yeah. There's not an actual thing. It's just a mistake. Right. Um, that's going. That's somehow being really bad. Uh, and I thought that was a really interesting take on like just. Oh well, it was just this thing. It thought that the kid was what you were supposed to be, right? So then it made everybody else that, and I was like, "Oh well, that's okay." I was like, "That was kind of cool." It was kind of a happy ending. No, you know, no bad guy had to be like destroyed or whatever. It was just kind of like, "Oh, that's nice." <laughs> yeah. And the, um, the you know with the with the ending too, uh, with where you get. Uh... You get Nancy basically admitting her mistake that she's not Jamie's sister, Mm -hmm. she's Jamie's mother. Um, Once again, huge father and son, mother and daughter themes in the show, uh, parents and their children. It's Mm -hmm. very human. 
and the doctor doesn't have that. Um, the doctor doesn't doesn't appear human that way, and doesn't even understand humanity that way. Um, you know, from the very first episode, he doesn't even care about Mickey. He never even thinks that Mickey could have been dead. You know, he doesn't care. It's that's not important. He pulled the head off the the Auton and took the head with him so we could find Mickey, or so we could find the nest. Now you're just letting him melt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, exactly. No, please. <laughs> And that's and that's the doctor. He doesn't he doesn't yeah. think about those things. Though um, one of the most important pieces of these two episodes, uh, when talking with Doctor Constantine, and Doctor Constantine says, you know, before the war, I was a father and a grandfather, and now I'm neither. And you get the first very important piece of information about the doctor and about the Time Lord society. The doctor says, yeah, I know the feeling. I know how. I, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, the doctor before the time war was a father and a grandfather, and now yeah. he's not. He he his his attachment to World War Two, you know, is very much so his involvement from the time war. This war on Earth symbolizes everything that the time war symbolized for him and his people. And when you look at it that way, you kind of say, okay, well, the time war was that big of an event for him. If World War Two could change people here, you know, change us as a people then the Time War should really have changed him as a person, too. Um, I feel like that's a really important piece of who the Doctor is and how these stories affect him. You know, he's not the same man at the end of the season. In each season, he's not the same man. And that that's that's a part of it. Right. Um, did you have anything else on this one? I had been anything else. I, I absolutely love that nobody dies. That's... <laughs> Stephen Moffat will, he will, man, he will kill every last character off in an episode. By the end, not a single person died. Uh, yeah. It's, this happens time and again. It's everybody <laughs> lives, Rose. Everybody lives. That's right. Um, moving on. The next to one is, what? Moving on to Boomtown. Yes. The next one, yeah, Boomtown. Uh, I was, a, I gotta say, I was a little disappointed with this one. It was kind of a kind of a down before the, up, the big up of the mm-hmm. finale but uh, I was like not this lady again <laughs> first of all <laughs> I was like oh jeez so they go back to Cardiff to, to fuel up which is interesting mm-hmm. there's the return, the return of the rift at Cardiff yes, yes. And they, yeah they go to Cardiff and there's the they, they fuel up at the rift um, which uh, I think it's interesting that they have a t- there's like one town that like they kind of go back to a lot right <laughs> and like because of this rift all this stuff starts happening um well that rift will become important later on that town that area right there uh with the uh with the first spinoff show uh, that we won't get to we won't talk about until uh, season three but um there that that location becomes important because of the rift and because of the stuff that happens there and right. um yeah it's 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 you're right and, and that was that was russell t davies he wanted he wanted to bring notoriety to a small town like cardiff you know cardiff's cardiff's huge but it wasn't you know it's you, you don't go say you don't say i'm gonna fly to the uk and i'm gonna go to cardiff you say i'm gonna go to london or you know i'm gonna go to north hampshire or something you know and then i'm gonna go to france and then i'm gonna go to spain you don't you don't think Wales. You don't think Cardiff. Yeah. And, um, that was that was what Russell wanted to do. He wanted to pull that in and say, "Hey, come on, this is this is gonna this is gonna be a place, and this should be a place because this is this is really the UK." Right. So I didn't watch this one. Um, I read the synopsis. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, she wants to leave the planet, or she's building. I for. Help me out here. She's building the so Boomtown. Boomtown is about uh, yeah the remaining Slovene who didn't die at the end of that two parter. She wants to get home, um, but basically she's going to just destroy the planet and ride ride the destruction out uh, on this basically intergalactic surfboard. Mm-hmm. And she knows that she needs to use the rift to do it, and she knows she can attract someone eventually who'll want to use the rift, specifically the Doctor. And she sort of she sort of convinces him. She 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 uh, you know tricks him into going out to dinner with her, and you know so she can bide her time until eventually the rift activates and uh, the doctor himself has put the planet once again into mortal peril <laughs> just by being there. 
Yeah. Um, now, in the in the synopsis, it just says the TARDIS opens, and she looks into the heart of the TARDIS, mm-hmm. and it turns her back. She wanted a second chance at life, so what it does is it turns her into an egg. Mm-hmm. Now, so what the heart of the TARDIS? If someone looks into it, what happens is it sort of reads their mind. And kind of gives them what they want? Is this what I'm... Well, yes and no. This is the first real example how the TARDIS is alive. And mm-hmm. in this particular situation, the TARDIS, knowing what was happening and knowing what, what it was doing, uh, the TARDIS became the final judge. Once again, the, look, at, look at the second episode of the season. The Doctor lets Cassandra die. And everything has its place and everything has its time. He lets her die. And that's yeah. that's harsh. That's the bitterness, and that's the pain. And now, Rose has made him better. The Doctor doesn't do anything. He lets the TARDIS make the decision, and the TARDIS made a decision that was kind. It turned her back into an egg. It used its power of time travel, and and, and, and it, it forced her to become young again so she could be raised differently. So the, mm-hmm. the Doctor shows a real, a real pacifism now at the end. And that's that's the difference. That's where, you know, that's that's where the, the it has taken us. But it it wasn't him. He didn't do it. He didn't have to do it. The TARDIS did it for him. Now, why did the TARDIS open? Because it, because it did. The TARDIS is the, the TARDIS is alive. It can do many weird things. Uh, right. No, it 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 just did. Um, you know, it. It didn't want to die. It didn't want the Earth to be destroyed, and it wanted to give her a chance, and so it did. And it forced her to look, and she did, and she got what she needed. That's interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. That the, yeah, because we later see the TARDIS sort of. Um, you sort of see. Yeah, you, you see a representation. A lot, uh, sort of making you know communicating with the Doctor or whatever. But this, yeah, so this is the first time we see it. Like, it actually makes a choice to open up. And I think it's interesting because later, Rose is trying to open it up and she's got to get that big truck <laughs> with the big chain. It doesn't want to open up. Well, and that's and, and that's a different situation, too. Um, you know, really, you had the TARDIS at the center of what would eventually become the destruction of the planet. The TARDIS made a choice. Later on, the TARDIS is just sitting there fairly lifeless. It's not doing anything. It's done its job. It's taken Rose home, uh, which mm-hmm. we'll get to here in a second. But, yeah, it's taken Rose home, and that, and because it has, it doesn't have to open. It shouldn't open. It doesn't want to take Rose back. But, of course, yeah. as we're going to get to, she is the bad wolf. Mm-hmm. Um, anything else on this one? I was going to say, I don't have anything else. We can move on to the finale. To bad wolf. Bad wolf. Episode 12. Yes. Part one of two. Um, I had to say, this is a weird way to start off the finale. TV show parodies. <laughs> like, I was like, I thought maybe oh, this God. was one. The but, android was brilliant. Oh, uh, that's just funny right there. I, I was like, because the android, and I was like, waka waka. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the future just, can be goofy. Yes, it can. It sure can, especially in the Doctor Who world. Uh, so Bad Wolf basically is a hundred years after, yes, yeah, the, uh, the events of Long Game on Satellite Five. We're now near two hundred thousand, one hundred thousand, and mankind has not gotten better, which is something no. the Doctor finds out once he escapes the game. Uh, they've been kidnapped from the TARDIS. Rose, Jack, and the Doctor all spread out into three different games, um, and by the time we get to a point where they're sort of meeting up again. Rose has been shot by the android and supposedly disintegrated. The Doctor and Jack together uh, escape from custody. They get to the heart of a uh, station uh, of game station, um, Satellite Five, only to find Which, out there was, one, there was an interesting thing there yeah. where they 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 get um, they get captured by the the guards mm-hmm. and um, the Doctor goes let's do it or something to Jack and they like Jack beats up most people but the doctor actually grabs a guy and like throws him against the wall and I was like 
The Doctor doesn't fight people. It's one of the rare really, times. Really, yeah, it was one of the very rare times I've ever seen him actually like and that's, fight that's with fists. Fist. No, with with <laughs> physical force. Yeah, it was really interesting to see well, he, that. He thought he thought Rose was dead. He was angry again. You yeah, know? he was one really. And he yeah. trusted and he loved. He cared about. You know. Um, well, that, that's that's an interesting point. That that's what drove him to be that way. But then mm-hmm. immediately after, you see them. You get up, they get up there with the gun, with guns. They get up to the control station, and he doesn't shoot anyone. He actually throws the gun to them and says, "Yeah, yeah, you know, I was never going to shoot you." So his his level of violence was just to get them out of a situation. It was never to actually hurt anyone. Again, mm-hmm. the doctor being a pacifist. Um, now I I don't know about you. When I was watching this the first time. Um, of course, the very first time you see that Rose is alive, and you, they kind of cut to her, and you just you hear the sound. You know it's the Daleks. And you keep building to it and building to it and building to it. I was so it. excited. <laughs> Until finally the Daleks show up on screen, and you were just, you were like, oh my god, you're freaking out. Because it is it is the coolest thing ever that these guys return. I was like, yay, more Daleks! <laughs> I mean, I know it's bad, right? But, yeah, I mean, right. it's, it's good for... For the show, I love Daleks. They're, I mean, they're just amazing. Uh, yeah, there's a big Emperor Dalek, and he's he ain't happy. Oh, he's got a deeper voice than the rest of them. Almost, almost inaudible sometimes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. I do. I do love. Truly love the TARDIS flying into the the heart of the Dalek swarm. I love the Doctor leaving the conversation, going back inside the TARDIS, and just that moment where he's paused, where he's got his head against the the door, and he's just you know he knows, he just knows this is his fault. He knows that this is his responsibility, and he knows he can never get away from this. Um, this is of course bringing us into Parting of the Ways, the last episode, uh, which is the fight. It's the battle against the Daleks to save the future where the Doctor sends Rose back in the TARDIS um, and possibly one of the t- most touching moments of season one is the hologram the message he leaves for Rose yes. you know I actually when he sent her he, I actually teared up a little bit this time when I watched it Yeah. Um, when he sent her he, put, he, he tricked her and left the TARDIS and then he stopped and then he Sonic screwdriver did it or whatever and it flew away and I was just like man that it's, was rough it's heartbreaking mm-hmm. now uh, you know it all it all sort of culminates into one of one of the important facets of the doctor it's it's mentioned but it's not really like said exactly the doctor builds a weapon and the weapon is supposed to be able to destroy anything Dalek but he doesn't have time to refine it so it'll destroy everything mm-hmm. and Though they don't make too much of a mention of it, they do reference that this was the same device used at the end of the Time War. This is what destroyed his home planet and destroyed everything and everyone. And the Doctor is building it again, and this is this is his second time doing it. You know, he's he's using the same weapon again. So we finally get a sense of what the Doctor had to do during the Time War. We finally get a sense of what really happened to end it and why he's so why this is so important why he's in so much mm-hmm. pain is that once again he has to make a choice which might actually kill everything and everyone now how do, yeah. how do you live with that choice you know right. and, and this time around though he's had Rose so he gets to that point and he can't do it he, he refuses he just won't murder everybody mm-hmm. he's become the doctor again he's become a pacifist yeah yeah, he he yeah, he really went right right from the end of the time war to this point. He sort of grew he grew out of that anger. Yeah. He got rid of that anger that he'd been he had. And Rose helped him to it. Um before we get to like the very end of this, mm-hmm. I had a question. Sure. The last couple of episodes I kept hearing the the um the the term extrapolator. Him and Jack kept talking about the extrapolator. That was that board that uh, back in Boomtown that the Saladine lady. That's what she had. It was called an extrapolator. Yeah, um, that's what they were hooking up to the TARDIS, which caused you know the 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 problem with the rift and everything. That's what creates oh, okay. a force field. See, I didn't watch that one, so I, I must have missed that part. There you this go. Time and they kept and they they used it for something else. 
They used that was a force field on the TARDIS to get. Uh, yeah. 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 Get and then, they, the and then yeah, they kept saying the extrapolator, and I'm like, what is the extrapolator? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um. So let's. So, okay, the, so yeah. He sends Rose back. Yeah, he sends Rose back. Um, of course, she then realizes. Uh, she sees the she sees the sees mad wolf everywhere, and she remembers it. I mean, if you go back and watch the episodes, it's there. Mm-hmm. Every episode has a reference to bad wolf, and that's that's yeah. huge. You mm-hmm. know, that's the first time we see that theme come full circle. Um, you know, and we'll see it again, obviously, as the show goes on. But it's it's neat to see that she realizes that, and then once she returns, she gets the time vortex. Yes, she 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 hooks the big truck up to it. And- Pulls it off and she looks at it. The, the swirlies go in her eyes. The swirlies go in the eyes from the TARDIS console. Yes, mm-hmm. and uh, she shows up and she's like, she ends the time war. Man. Yeah, she's just pretty badass as far as like, <laughs> just she's just like I said one one line which I, I loved. I thought it was great. She's like something along the lines of I see every atom of your existence. And, and I, I divide them, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and all the Daleks just disintegrate into little pieces. And, and it's great. Yeah. I mean, she, it, she she destroys them through time and space. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, they don't touch on it much later on. I, I I don't know why, but for me watching it, I always felt like this was meant to happen. Maybe Rose really is different. Maybe she's the one person who could have done these things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe that's why the Doctor was so lenient with her, why he why he brought her with him. He didn't even realize that she was a part of this bigger plan. Mm-hmm. And maybe in the first episode, you know, he, he, he kind of pushed her away at first and said, no, you, I don't want you to come with me. You know, maybe he saw something in her that was kind of maybe a little interesting to that point. Um, speaking of disintegrating, yes. um, in Bad Wolf, they figure out that she's not dead mm-hmm. because it's not a disintegrator; it's a trans trans beam. Mm-hmm. So these people on these reality shows and these game shows, they're being transmitted. He said across time and space. Where are all these people ending up? Is my question. The Dalek fleet. Oh, really? That's who the Daleks were. Oh, you're okay. That's they, right. They were okay, cells of these human beings for a hundred years that were being. Cultivated and turned into that. Yes, okay. See, I missed that part. I thought they were talking about when they said that about the human race or whatever. I, okay. But I get that now. That that's they used so them. scary, man. That is, yeah, that's pretty... That's pretty crazy right there. <laughs> Gruesome. Um, but then they were like, no, we've purged all human from a... We are pure Dalek. Or whatever. Now, nah, yeah. you don't see pure Daleks for quite a while. No, they were wrong. Um, so, so she gets rid of all the Daleks, mm-hmm. and but then she, it's but then it's killing her. She gets a headache. She gets my head. It hurts. Somebody. I think you need a doctor. <laughs> Cheesiest pickup line ever. Yes, for real. <laughs> and then they and then fan service for all the all the Uvian girls out there. Oh, they kiss. Oh my gosh. Uh, so, and yeah, uh, episode ends with the most important staple of the Doctor mythology. Uh, he regenerates. Regenerates. And and I loved his line right before he regenerated. He said, Rose, you were fantastic. And you know what? So was I. So, I thought, I was like that. You know what? You were fantastic, buddy. <laughs> it's, he was. And then, and then he turns into David Tennant. Yes, and the, the, the interesting thing that I th- I think is 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 that David Tennant was already cast before the whole obviously from the beginning, but he couldn't do it at first because he had other obligations, right? Or right? Yeah, yeah. So so I kind of feel like they were like, well, let's have somebody else do it first, and then we'll because we really want to get this thing going. And then we'll get you in there when when he regenerates or whatever, right? And I feel like when he says, you know, I, so was I. I was fantastic. It was like, you know, I wasn't the first choice, but guess what? Yeah, I was pretty darn good. I could dash. And 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 I yeah, and I, I agree with that definitely. Um, sometimes you know, I always I think about 
Eccleston, only be, especially because it was only for a year. Right. Kind of that kind of makes it just like a little. <clears throat> bless you. Thank you. Makes it a, it makes it a little too less. You know what I mean? He he didn't. It wasn't he enough for me. Here, though I mean, you can't. You really don't know what kind of doctor he could have been, and he didn't give us a right. chance to hate him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. It would have been uh, easy. I, whenever there's a now, especially with the with the next two, like whenever it changed, especially at least. After it gets like at least a year, I, t- I, t- I tend to really like the person. Yeah, and and I really liked Eccleston, and then Tennant was great though. And then Tennant is great. He's my favorite, really. But when it changed at first, I was like, "Well, who's this guy?" Right. You know, that's how it usually happens. You're like, "Who's this jerk? <laughs> why is why should I watch it? No, why should I? Who, yeah, who there? cares now? This guy, he looks dumb." <laughs> Um, and I felt that way with Matt Smith too. I was like, this guy, it's kind of it's weird. I don't know if I. Of course, he's great now. Yeah, it's, uh, and well, and Matt Smith was a big one because David Tennant. Well, it's, we'll get into it, but David Tennant's very well loved. Uh, yes. Eccleson's time in the TARDIS was a great, a, a great season. It was a great year. It was what Doctor Who needed to get back on the air. And I, I seriously, I think to to this date. He is still one of the best actors to play the Doctor. Um, yes, is, he was very uh, good. I think he's under he's underappreciated because the guy that followed him is so phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, uh, really. David, David Tennant just blows your mind at how good he can be at being the Doctor. So, yeah. Um, That's why I really hope that so, like someday he if he if there was some kind of problem, someday he can push that aside and say, you know what, I'll come back. I'll yeah. do this, you know, multi-doctor thing or whatever. I mean, that would just be fantastic. Fantastic. All right, so, so to sum up the season, um, if, if anyone didn't already know, the big theme, of course, was Bad Wolf. Mm-hmm. Uh, was leading up to, once again, the Daleks are there. It's the time war all over again for the Doctor, and he's he's healed he's himself. The yeah. And, uh, the, of course, the Bad Wolf was leading them there the whole time, and that she was the bad wolf. Uh, she took that idea of the bad wolf, because she had seen it, and she spreads it through time and space. So every time they see the bad wolf somehow, it's subconsciously leading them on to where they need to be. Mm-hmm. Um, really a, a solid season, not a lot of diversion from the theme. Uh, very few episodes that were not a part of the plan. Uh, which you can't really say uh, going forward that there'll be a lot more individual episodes that are just sort of hey this is here this is a fun idea let's just do this for a bit yeah um, especially once you get to Matt Smith there'll be a lot of those episodes mm-hmm. and it's it's nice it's nice to see a season that was so concise so well thought out um, yeah good times yeah very good I, I enjoyed kind of revisiting it. It'd been so long since I've seen really any of it, and I'm excited to get into the second, third, right. and all that because I haven't seen those in a while. <laughs> um, it's always fun to go back and rewatch the season. If, if any of you out there have finished it and need just need a little bit more Eccleston, just go back and rewatch it. Um, if you need a reason to rewatch, <laughs> this podcast is that reason. There you go. You can listen along and and you can play play along at home. Play along. You know, home. exactly. <laughs> Record your own podcast because we're the first to do it. So you can exactly. Yours now. Yes. Send um, it to us. We'll redo them for you. It's okay. Final well, thoughts. Like, um. Final thoughts. Favorite scene. Favorite. Oh man. Probably when the Dalek gets to the stairs. <laughs> And I, cause you, you, my inner dialogue was running wild through this episode. I was like, "Look at this thing! It's got bumps all over it, and you know, it looks like a, it looks like a, a, a ear of corn or something, the plunger on it." And then, and then it gets to the stairs. I'm like, "Oh no! It can't go anywhere on the stairs!" I was laughing so hard the whole episode. And then he's elevate, and he goes up, and I was just, I lost it. I lost it. It was so funny. Oh, good scene. Yes, and then they came back. I was so excited, and they come back some more. So, yeah, in future seasons. So it's it's great. 
Uh, I think my favorite scene uh, is well, it's it's the explanation of why he made a screwdriver Sonic. Uh, him and Jack, you know, I've got a Sonic, a Sonic what? Nah, nothing. A Sonic what? Screwdriver. Who says? Who sees a screwdriver and thinks this could be a little more Sonic? And the doctor's reply of, uh, "Well, you've never had a really long night, been really bored, and a lot of cabinets to put up." <laughs> uh, it's just, it's, it's perfect. That's so Doctor Who. Yeah. So, definitely my favorite scene right there. That conversation. Mm-hmm. That's got to be my favorite. Well, I hope you enjoyed. Think, uh, yes, we I hope everyone enjoyed this little chat we had and. Uh, Join so us we, next week for yes, mm, next week. Me. Hopefully, we're gonna try to do these weekly. We still don't have a date for the premiere, mm. so it may it may be weekly, and then there may be a break. Or if, once we find out when the premiere is, we we'll, we might do how many weeks up to that premiere. We're gonna kind of play it by ear as far as when we find out when the date is gonna be for season seven. But uh, yeah, join us next week for season two. And um, more commentary from the, the two dudes from Gallifrey. Time all right. Wolf. Oh, voices from the Vortex. Voices from the Vortex. We hope you all had, had a good time. We had a good time. Uh, see you all later. See ya. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> Elevate. Elevate. Elevate.